I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupomier. And today we will be discussing tuberculosis. Hmm. Now, tuberculosis is an infection caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis, a, a pretty significant um, pathogen in I'll the say. history of the world. I'll say. Some would suggest that more people have died from tuberculosis than any single other pathogen in, in human history. Wow. And it continues to be a major killer. It's one of the top three causes of death. We've got HIV AIDS, we've got malaria and tuberculosis. And maybe tuberculosis is number one with about a million deaths per year. Pretty significant. It is. People, you know, think that we live in the 21st century. We've got flat screen televisions. We can travel anywhere in the world. How could there be tuberculosis? No, an excellent question. <laughs> but there still is. Yeah. And I'll say not only is tuberculosis important in human history, but this is actually what got me interested in infectious disease. All oh, right. I know you always thought it was attending your parasitology lectures. Well. Which I found interesting. <laughs> but you did attend them at least. That was good. <laughs> and I attended. Uh, but no, it was during my time at um, Bellevue at NYU School of Medicine that um, my mentor, who was a fellow mountaineer, um, was doing tuberculosis research. He was in the pulmonary division. Okay. And I actually went and uh, worked in his lab for a while. Great. And um, that sort of got me excited about trying to um, generate new knowledge um, to contribute to the medical corpus. And it was research on tuberculosis. Wow. Um, so let's talk a little bit. So we, we've already established it's a, it's a bacteria. Yes. A mycobacterium special tuberculosis. Special kind of bacteria. A special, in a sense, higher <laughs> order type of bacterium. Yeah. It has a different surface, a, a mycolic acid surface, so it exactly. stains differently. This is our one of our acid fast um, bacteria. Hard to kill. Um, hard to kill, slow growing. Very good. There are fast growing mycobacterium that we won't discuss today, but mycobacterium tuberculosis is sort of a slow, prodding, exactly. very successful organism. Um, it's suggested that a third of the world's population is currently infected with mycobacterium That's tuberculosis. Incredible. Let me say that one more time. A third, 30% of the planet. That's so billions 7. of people. 7.6 billion. Divide that by three. Can you do that in your head? That's okay. No, I'm, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting. <laughs> um, so this is a huge problem. Um, when you get exposed to tuberculosis, only about 10% of people will ever get sick. Right. And so that, that's a challenge. So when I say that a third of the people on the planet are infected, 90% of them will never get sick. A minority will get sick. About half of those people who are exposed to tuberculosis will get sick within the first year or two. And the other half of the 10% who will get sick will get sick sometime in their lifetime. And it may be many, many decades later when maybe they're older, when maybe their immune system can't control the infection. Yes. Tuberculosis can affect our lungs, and that's what mainly we're going to talk about today, our pulmonary tuberculosis, which makes up about 90% of the cases of tuberculosis. But we can also have tuberculosis effect. We're going to go through the list. Please. You can name any part of the body. <laughs> our lymph nodes. Can you have uh, dermatologic tuberculosis? We can have, um, we can not only have tuberculosis infect the skin, but we can actually have the tuberculids, which are cutaneous or skin manifestations that are an inflammatory response to low inoculum tuberculosis infection, but a hypervigilant immune response. Got it. Um, you could have tuberculosis affect the joints, wow. the spine, the lining of the heart, mm. the lining of the, the abdomen, so you can have an abdominal. Um, really any, anywhere. You can even have tuberculosis in the meninges, in the central nervous system. Good. So we have TB manifesting in many, many ways. We're not gonna be able to cover it all. So today we're gonna to focus mainly on pulmonary tuberculosis. So how is it acquired? Breathing. I always tell people not to breathe. breathe. <laughs> <laughs> or if you must breathe, breathe out. <laughs> I like that, I like that. Um, actually, that is an interesting um, feature of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is airborne. It's an airborne transmission. It's droplet. you there. produce droplet nuclei, 
droplet nuclei are small enough that they'll actually float around. And they might float around for as much as half an hour after someone coughs or sneezes. Um, a nice thing is children do not have a proper cough reflex. They can't produce dispersible droplet nuclei. So I always feel a little more comfortable taking care of children. But right. once someone reaches about 16 years of age, uh -huh. they can adequately produce droplet nuclei. They can fill wow. a room. Wow. And what about um, uh, fomites? Um, I always worry that, you know, uh, I'm not a New Yorker by birth, but I'm a New Yorker by trade because I've worked in New York City all of my adult life, basically. And you go to the subway, Mm -hmm. And you look down on the platform of the subway, and you see these little round black spots. Okay. And someone once asked me what those little round black spots were, and I said, that's discarded chewing gum. Okay. So underneath the discarded chewing gum is portions of their saliva and their oral cavity, and perhaps something that they've coughed up. If they had tuberculosis and they were actively throwing out bacteria, could any of those bacteria survive in those conditions? So the, the nice thing, and this is going to be important, um, because this is one of those diseases where the people taking care, the staff, the clinicians, can potentially get sick while right. taking care. I, of course. And the, the good or bad, um, you're going to basically inhale this. Someone has to generate droplet nuclei. Right, okay, this is so. not a fomite disease. So this these is not a hand neutral. washing disease. Oh, okay. This is going to be an inhaling oh. um, exposure. Oh, okay. um, one of the triage things, and this, as we've talked about, the way clinics are set up, is the individual might come to the clinic. Yep. They get checked in. Maybe the chief complaint is recorded. Um, and if the chief complaint is, for instance, cough, a lot of clinics, and actually clinics that I've worked in, we use a two-week cutoff. If the cough has been going on for more than two weeks, huh. that raises the suspicion for tuberculosis. Right. You may not want to then have that individual sit in your waiting room <laughs> with all the children and the exactly. young mothers and exactly. the pregnant and, and really anybody. Sure. Um, you also probably don't want them sitting right next to all the staff coughing away. Right. Um, so a lot of times we'll use a two-week cough cutoff as a triage, if you have the right incidence of tuberculosis, to have rapid tuberculosis testing before they then get to move on to enter the, the general population pool. Right. Two weeks is a pretty good cutoff in most areas. Three weeks they might use in some. Um, other areas you get more into associated symptoms with the cough. Because two weeks of cough is actually quite common. Allergic rhinitis, people with allergies. I was thinking, I've had two weeks of cough. Exactly. And if, and if we were in a more tuberculosis endemic area, I would not sit so close. I would not <laughs> breathe. Um, I'm not, and that's interesting, you know, the not sit so close, the six feet of separation, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Because it's, it's in the air, it's right. going to circulate. That's right. Um, fortunately, it usually takes a significant inoculum. This is usually not something you're seeing on subways. There often isn't even transmission in airplanes. It's usually people living with you. But with a third of the world infected, mm -hmm. you're going to have to come up with some other reason why the people go on to get sick than exposure because one third mm -hmm. of the world is, like you said, in the billions of yeah. people. Why don't why, why doesn't, doesn't everybody everyone, get why sick? Why doesn't everyone get sick? Why don't they get sick? Um, so let, let, we'll do that as an aside right now. Um, part of it is there does appear to be a genetic um, susceptibility. Uh. And when I was, I was working in Nepal, this is many years ago, I was working at Beer Hospital in Kathmandu. Um, and I used to really enjoy picking up the languages when I would go places. I, now I find that quite difficult. <laughs> and so while I was, I was working long enough at the beer hospital that I was studying Nepali a few hours every, every day after I would wow. work in the hospital. And um, I was learning, you know, how to order food and do all the basic things. But I also was very interested in the words that they might use for different infections. Of course. And they had two words for tuberculosis. Really? And one of the words was tuberculosis that you, you catch from someone who's sick, and the other is tuberculosis that runs in families. Oh. And they had noticed that the tuberculosis was oh, clustered oh, in certain families. And when you consider everyone sure. being exposed, sure. you could start to see that. That's right. 
And when the bacteria was first identified by Robert Koch, um, you can see Harrison's, which is a big textbook of medicine. <laughs> you can see the 40 page section the year before the bacilli was discovered, explaining the genetic basis and showing the family trees. And then the next year it becomes very brief and this is an infectious it's disease. <laughs> it's an infectious right. disease. <laughs> and all that was forgotten, but maybe not because there yeah. are two, yeah. there are two yeah. questions there. That's Exposure right. alone. That's right. Um, the second is issues with your immune system. If you have HIV AIDS, if for some other reason you have cancer, um, if you're on maybe certain medicines that might reduce your immune system, right. maybe even just age alone. We see reactivation as people become more senior and their immune system can no longer contain um, the tuberculosis. So let's talk about other associated symptoms. You've got your cough, you may have blood, you may have blood to sputum, that's gonna raise your suspicion. You may have weight loss. Sure. That's gonna raise your suspicion for tuberculosis. Yeah. Um, you may have <clears throat> night sweats. People tell you, I wake up in the middle of the night and my, where I sleep, it's stretched. I have to change the sheets, I have to change my clothes. Um, these are a lot of the things, the wasting that goes uh, associated. So it's. It's a disease that's captured the imagination of the art world over time also. And I yes. can recall in my um, brief but significant encounter with uh, world literature that Dostoevsky uh, wrote beautiful descriptions of what cavitary tuberculosis was all about. Mm -hmm. I believe the woman's name was Camille. Okay. And uh, the book was, I believe, Crime and Punishment, but I'm not sure it's either that or War and Peace. I think it was Crime and Punishment. But to see this poor individual suffering almost throughout the book mm -hmm. from cavitary tuberculosis. Now, I always remember um, La Boheme, ah, which is the which is a operetta. Another and artistic. And it was actually, um, at one point, a third of all deaths in Europe were due to tuberculosis. So it found its way into the literature. Sure. Um, there's actually, apparently in Bollywood, there was a movement where it was embraced. Huh. And so it became, you know, and uh, it's been romanticized, the, the bullfighter, the, the dying oh, young, yes, there was yes, a whole, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Um, which is really interesting when you think of what a horrible disease horrible, and what a horrible right. death, I mean, a that slow, somehow it was. Insidious. Oh. But let's, so let's talk about diagnosis. So someone comes okay. in and you're concerned. Um, and again, this is one of those diseases that the world has mobilized to try to target. Yep. And there is a, a technology called gene expert. And so traditionally, the diagnosis of tuberculosis was, reminds me of much of malaria. You would, someone would cough, you would do a smear, you would do this special acid fast staining, sure. and you would look for basically little red um, bacilli. Yep. And if someone was quite ill, had a high mycobacterial load, the smear might be teeming. Um, if it was less, you might just see a few of them. Um, it required a certain load, and then you might send it off for culture. Culture could take six to eight weeks. <laughs> exactly. And during that six to eight weeks, they could be spreading disease. And actually, what a course. large percentage of tuberculosis historically has been spread by people who are smear negative, but culture positive. Right. So this technology, this gene expert technology, little cartridges, about that, about that big. So we're gonna say one or two inches tall by an inch square. Um, the person creates sputum. It's put into this cartridge. The cartridge is popped into the machine. The gene expert can generate um, results in about 90 minutes. So we say oh. less than two hours, That's still which is quick. much quicker than having to wait two months <laughs> for culture. That's right. So very quick turnaround. It costs about 10 US dollars mm. per test. Worth every penny. And it's been tremendous in case identification. The test also can tell you at that moment in time whether or not it's resistant to some of the frontline agents. Got it. So much like um, HIV AIDS, a lot of tuberculosis is being, um, the diagnosis and treatment is being orchestrated 
um, by the government and with the help of non-government organizations, where the non-government organizations or the government will be supplying the medications. They'll actually be doing what they call directly observed therapy. So once you've Compliance. made the diagnosis, <laughs> sure. they wanna make sure the person gets treated. That's right. They'll even do contract tracing. So they'll find out this individual is positive. Let's go test their children. Let's go test their parents. Let's test everyone living in that area or the context. Right. Um, and so usually we start off with a four drug cocktail for the first two months. And then we drop down to a two drug cocktail. Um, but I'll say the specifics of those treatments are gonna go beyond um, this. Um, and a lot of times they'll be, um, be driven by local drug resistance um, prevalences. Right. So the big worry I've been led to believe through you know, lots of publications from WHO and United Nations uh, health um, uh, surveillance teams around the world is the emergence of multiple drug resistant tuberculosis that none of these drugs will affect whatsoever. And that hasn't happened on a global basis yet, but everyone is waiting in fear of this happening. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion about that? So it's happening. It is happening. It is happening. Um, in certain areas, there's um, very high rates of resistance to the frontline drugs, which would be isoniazid and rifampin. So we're having to use inferior drugs. Um, and there certainly are cases now of tuberculosis resistant to all our drugs. So it, it's a, such a slow growing organism. How can resistance arise? Is this fast or slow in terms of so, resistance so, arising? So it's interesting. The, the resistance <clears throat> is there to begin with. And so let's take an individual who has a cavitary disease. So they have a right. big cavity. It's full of tuberculosis. Right. Let's say they have 10 to the 11th organisms okay. in that cavity. Say no more. You just. Um, but no, I'm going to give you the math. I'll give you the math. Okay. If you look at rifampin and isoniazid, the number of organis organisms that just have innate resistance are to the order of 10 to the sixth or 10 to the ninth. Wow. So if you just gave one drug, think of how many organisms would just be resistant. Sure. And that's why we try to approach it with Multiple. four drugs yeah, that's because right. there are already your organisms that are resistant. You can do, you're selecting for them. Of course. So that's the big, that's the big. So it's really important. Um, when you're addressing tuberculosis, um, that you make sure that they get all the adequate drugs, because the and last thing we want right. is that's to right. be breeding, selecting for drug that's, resistance, that's exactly and then right. having that spread through your communities. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I heard, of course, was that within weeks after you start taking this drug, which you have to take for months, you start feeling much, much better. And you assume, because you're feeling so much better, well, I don't have to take this anymore because mm -hmm. I'm no longer better. suffering, but you really still are, right? Yeah. So compliance is about 90% of medicine anyway, so that's mm -hmm. particularly true here. You know, and as mentioned, this um, can get a little more complicated. If it's CNS disease, you're, you might be treating longer. Yeah. If there's a large cavity and they're still smear positive when you reassess it two months. Right. Um, so again, people expert in uh, treatment of tuberculosis. Um, there usually will be centers and um, a lot of organizations around um, making sure this happens properly. But I think the big takeaway, um, think about when you go to these areas, you may be putting you and your staff at risk. So have in place algorithms, approaches, so that patients that might have um, tuberculosis can be identified early before your clinic becomes an epicenter for the next local tuberculosis spread. Right. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yep, we'll be back soon.